and uh, everybody knows what quad code is here. Quad code is a project that uh, Donald and I have been working on for about three years now. That's a native code compiler for Tail. This, the idea here is that it is not a native code compiler for a Tickle-like language. It is a native code compiler for Tickle. <coughs> its input is Tickle byte code. Its output is machine code. Uh, it um, deals with the fact that there's some stuff that in Tickle is uncompilable simply by refusing to compile it since the interpreter remains available. Uh, the present stage, it does procedures only. Uh, it does not do methods and lambda forms yet, and it probably will never do global scripts unless you're uh, compiling an entire app, but even then the sh global script that launches the app would be left uncompiled. Uh, it's an ahead of time compiler. Uh, that's basically that we chose the LLVM infrastructure to do code generation, and that just who's slow to use it again. Uh, it uses some fairly advanced technology. We've got certainly PhD theses from the last five years that uh, we've implemented algorithms from. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, about a three-year collaboration between me, Donald. We were basing the idea on Yosa's uh, Tickle, LL LLVM Tickle, excuse me, which was a Tickle binding to LLVM's code generation. Uh, so at present, it's about 45,000 lines of Tickle uh, implementing the compiler and about 3,000 lines of C++ in Yosu's LLVM binding. It's still a work in progress, but the piece of software is never really done. Why are we doing this? The bytecode interpreter, everybody thinks, is too slow. Uh, it's uh, for most programs about 60 to 100 times slower than comparable C code. Uh, it's um, also, at this point, an incredibly delicate piece of code. Uh, it's a maze of go-tos. It's um, uh, got a lot of manual tweaks to the code to do things like uh, tail merging of parallel branches, and to do things like um, uh, effectively a multiple issue of certain bytecodes where it's looking ahead and combining bytecodes. It's a uh, uh, nasty, nasty process. Um, the, um, it, and it's really close to the achievable speed. Anything we do to it makes it slower. <laughs> it's at least converged on a local optimal. And really making it much faster, you have to kind of start compiling. Um, certainly to make it an order of magnitude faster, you'd have to start with the code. And we've been discussing this for years. Uh, Donald, me, Don, Miguel, rest in peace, Yos, many others. Um, it's, it's a very hard problem compiling technical to native code because of all the dynamic features. And we have had limited time to devote to it. <coughs> what really convinced us this was even possible were that there were a few things in the air that all came together. I had a Google Summer of Code student in 2010, uh, Oscar Ugur, who uh, actually went by Dogeen. Um, he implemented an assembler for bytecode, and people were hoping that you know, bytecode assembly would uh, allow busy procedures to run significantly faster. It didn't, because the bytecode language is really closely tied to Tickle. You can buy maybe 30%, not much more, by uh, removing redundancies from bytecode and assembly language. That wasn't going to be good enough. But what it showed us was that you can manipulate bytecode and you can uh, manipulate it safely. The bytecode assembler, uh, as far as we know, it's impossible to, for instance, introduce bytecode that's going to make the interpreter set fault. The, um, it uh, does check things like stack balance and uh, checks things like um, uh, uh, you know, list access and all those good things. And so it uh, doesn't al access outside allocated memory. 
and provably doesn't access outside allocated memory. So this really showed us that you could do at least rudimentary control flow analysis and reason about what bytecode is doing. At the same time, uh, there were various uh, compiler backend embeddings in Fickle starting to appear. There was uh, Critical, which I didn't invent, uh, which I'm misputting on the slide. Sorry, Andreas. There's was LLVM Fickle. There was TCC, and so it was possible to generate code without leaving Fickle. You didn't have to just you know uh, write a program to disk and run it through a tool chain. Uh, and at the same time, Carl, thanks Carl, um, issued the uh, uh, Flight Aware Challenges, where he had um, a nice little bonus for speeding up Tickle by a factor of two, and a, a, a rather handsome bonus for speeding it up by a factor of ten. It, you know, it turns out that Donald and I both have conflicts of interest, that if we actually achieve this, we can't accept it. <laughs> uh, but we're, uh, but it's, a, uh, it's a nice motivator in the community anyway. It uh, 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 brings up the community's level of interest. And so then, around about 2013, we launched the uh, QuietCode project. Uh, the early... Uh, in the early steps, I was studying getting from bytecode to quadcode, which is a four address, uh, th sorry, three address language. So most of the instructions are four element tickle lists. That's where it got its name. Uh, it's much easier to analyze and manipulate than uh, 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 bytecode because you don't have to keep track of all the stack stuff. It's, everything has got all its operands embedded in the instruction. Um, and that means that it also has explicit variables rather than moving things back and forth to the stack. So a lot of explicit temporary variables get introduced. Uh, and um, I was studying the data flow analysis on it. Uh, at that point, I wasn't doing static single assignment. And in fact, I implemented a data log compiler to aid in solving the data flow equations. So this was a data log implementation in Tickle on top of binary decision diagrams. And it uh, certainly got us quite a way. It got us to the point where uh, we were able to uh, uh, give a paper here on data log. We were able to uh, pre-announce the quad code project. And uh, uh, we're able to uh, you know, solve things like live variable analysis. And at the same time, Donald was working out how to take this three address code and translate it to LLVM assembly language. So that uh, we would get the LLVM intermediate representation and be able to use LLVM's optimizer to do the usual C compiler optimization things. And that's machine focused rather than tickle focused, so there is a huge amount of glue needed to do things like uh, managing the C's types versus Tickle's types. Um, but uh, at the 2014 conference, Donald and I managed to get uh, ourselves locked in a room with a pot of coffee and a bottle of Lagavulin and uh, <laughs> managed to do the first successful end-to-end -end integration. We had a procedure that computed the nth Fibonacci number and we're successfully able to compile it and execute it. And at that point, we're getting a speed up of about 15 times, something like that, for that particular procedure. That's uh, certainly an easy one to speed up because it's all integer arithmetic, but it's um, enough to be interesting. And then came the log slog, where one by one we were going through the bytecode commands adding them to the translator, adding them to the code generator. And at the same time, I was going crazy with the uh, uh, data log stuff, which I still use for rapid prototyping, but it's, uh, the, it's not quite fast enough to use in a uh, compiler. I was waiting for things to compile. Um, and uh, uh, special purpose data structures based on static single assignment form are a much uh, uh, better approach for uh, actually deploying the code. Um, the 
And uh, Donald announced the project formally at that year's Tickle Conference, which I believe I wasn't able to attend. Um, and then 2016, we were largely consolidating and refactoring code. We actually didn't get too much because for whatever reason, Donald and I were both insanely busy that year. Uh, this year, we've had some really big gains in uh, performance and in what we're able to support. Um, we implemented a technique that's called node splitting and loop healing that I'll get to for speeding up the loops on uh, objects of unknown type. Uh, we managed to come up with a slow, but s s relatively slow compared with the rest of Quaco, but serviceable implementation for modals and namespace variables. Um, we actually have an implementation of UpVar working that is doing pass by reference. And so uh, we've got near, so we've got near <coughs> complete support for the ordinary built-in commands, the, the 200 or so commands that uh, come with Tickle that aren't bytecoded. Um, what, uh, what we really don't have support for, well, what we don't have support for is things like eval that will never be supported, except in the special cases where by the other analysis we can reduce it to we're evaluating a constant or perhaps evaluating a single command with argument substitution. And remember, we can always fall back on the interpreter. So we've got some measurements here with like approximate speed ups. Um, like the Fibonacci benchmark, it's still, it's now up to about 25 times faster. That's uh, all integer arithmetic. The, uh, we've got a simple benchmark that just does a, a, a Taylor series approximation for cosine. It's uh, 11 times faster. Uh, we've got a thing that does a basic word count on a string, counts the number of instances of each word in this string, which is testing dictionary operations. And it's about a six time, five, six times speed up. Uh, um, duplicated. Tickle's own hash function in Tickle, and um, you know, running it in Tickle versus running it in the um, compiled code, it's about a five times speed up, and we can actually probably work on that significantly because uh, we don't have um, uh, really good um, Tickle's string index is not very well adapted to what we're doing. Um, We've got this uh, mutual recursion test. That's a recursive interpreter uh, that's walking through a parse tree. And it's the back end of a desktop calculator program. And even with all the recursion, we're getting 11 times speed up because we're able to track the data flow even in the recursive nest to identify types. This impure caller I'll get to, that's like the best case of numeric code sailing on the broad reach. It's, uh, you know, how fast is this really going to go? And the answer uh, for, you know, if everything is favorable, it goes as fast as C. Um, the, this line search and the flight aware bench, these are pieces of Carl's benchmark. And on those two uh, particular cases, we are meeting Carl's tenfold performance POE. So you know, this is actually running Carl's code unmodified for those two cases. And it's, um, uh, those are both numeric intensive, and those both easily meet his uh, performance goal. The way it works, we're starting with the Tickle procedure definition, and we're uh, pulling it down into Tickle bytecode. We're examining that uh, bytecode and doing a basic conversion to uh, uh, quad code, these free address instructions, without any data type identification. Then basically starting from constants in the program and starting from the known behavior of tickle commands, something like if this command isn't presented with an integer, it's going to throw an error. We're um, deducing what the types of objects are uh, moving forward. And you know, once we're past something which is, you know, if we've seen inker i, we know that the initial value that we put in i was an integer. 
And the, the result of inker was an integer. And uh, so we can make further type deductions based on that. And recursive this, we are actually able to identify the types of most values in the program. We're actually able to uh, uh, slice out and um, do all the type analysis. With prox, we often wind up uh, duplicating procedure definitions so that we can analyze them when called by different types. Essentially, for each call site, we get the cluster of types that it's passing and make a special instance of the procedure for that cluster of types. So it's uh, the poor man's polymorphism. Uh, if this procedure is called with uh, non-numeric string in one place and a number in the other, and it makes a difference to the generated code, we'll generate a specialized instance that accepts the number. Uh, that then goes into, that's what, and that's what the specialized step is. Then we do intermediate code issuing. We merge with a lot of standard inline functions that Donald did in LLVMIR assembly language that, uh, that handle basically the interface to the Tickle library and uh, put out the function definitions in native code by running them through the LLVM compiler. So the end result of that is that we get uh, C, uh, essentially a module implemented below the level of C. <coughs> that uh, is a tickle command that's callable and does the same thing as the uh, original procedure. Why does it work? Big thing is that we're avoiding the overheads. The big one, as Kian already uh, observed, is the uh, memory management, the boxing and unboxing of things in tickle objects. The other thing that we avoid that's surprisingly expensive is type checking. Failed type checks are extremely expensive because um, when you uh, because you have to convert the object whatever it is back to a string to try to parse that string to discover that it is not an integer and then immediately forget that information so the next time that you see it in a context that depends on whether it's an integer or not you're doing the same thing all over again um, the uh, then uh, value conversions are also you know string to int, int to string, uh, into string to float. Uh, the um, uh, there's a lot of uh, shimmering going on that we're able to eliminate, and that's all enabled by the type analysis. There's also a fair amount of control flow analysis that we can uh, uh, simply edit out some code paths. We know that they're impossible because uh, they're uh, uh, type checks that we know are going to uh, succeed or fail. And so, uh, and this extends to interprocedural analysis because we do keep track of types of arguments and types of results. This depends on a thing that we uh, that we're, uh, that's called path splitting or loop peeling. Let's look at this procedure to see what that actually means. We've got this proc x. I can't see my mouse there. Well, OK, we've got this proc x that's just doing a typical loop, a uh, typical for loop on an integer um, with the um, initial value coming from an argument. Let's say this is a library procedure. I'm compiling that out of context. All I know about that argument is it's a strap. Or it may be an int or a double, but all I really know about it is a string. So I come in and I um, uh, know that, well, OK, um, I, I've set it to A, it's a string. Um, I less than or equal to 10. That's complicated. Because uh, it, if it's an integer, we'll compare it as an integer. If it's a double, we'll promote that 10 to a double and compare it to double. If it's a string, then we'll stringify that 10 and compare it. And if it's a string like 0y, that's going to give some surprising results <laughs> compared with, uh, um, say, a hex constant. It's, uh, there's, uh, that, that ordering is not, it actually is not an ordering. Um, uh, the 
increment y, that's got to extract the integer from a tekelage, because I haven't, I don't have any information about what y is, because all I know, uh, oh, sorry, what i is, because all I know is I copied it from a. Um, and then uh, the bottom of the loop winds up having to put the thing back in a tickle obj because that's what I already committed to in the for loop. Because it has to work on the first pass where everything is still a string. So what this winds up looking like in uh, lower level code is I you know, put the i at zero, I put dollar a, I've got that complicated branch, I say, is it numeric? If it is not, I throw an error. Take the int from an obj, increment uh, the uh, increment y, increment i, put i back in an obj, and go to back around the loop. And so there's several allocations here. There's several type conversions. There's a type check. And I can't eliminate any of it yet because of that first trip for the loop. But the picture can, changes completely once I split, if I split off the first iteration. I just make an extra copy of the loop body that is used only for the first iteration. <coughs> so now I come in, I've got, I, this is before I've made the change. I've just got, I, all I did was at the bottom of the loop, I put a go to at the other copy, and the other copy is where the loop takes place. But now I've got a ton of op uh, uh, opportunities to optimize. I know that the usage of i from that time forward is going to be an inch. So I don't have to repack it in a tickle I can keep it unboxed. I know up here that this complicated check i greater than 10, i is now an integer. I don't need to do that complicated check I can just do an integer comparison. I can remove this type check because I know that coming from i equals i plus 1 or i equals i plus 1, it's already an integer. I don't need to box it. I don't need to, un I don't need to unbox it. I don't need to box it. All of that goes away. And the second and subsequent passes turn into a tightly coded machine code loop. <coughs> And so, you know, this splitting of the paths is what enables us to handle everything as a string at the boundary between tickle and quad code. Is that uh, most most loops, when there's an opportunity for this sort of optimization, actually get split? Yes. Uh, and you might tell me. Wait a couple of slides. But it would seem if you move, it is numeric up for assigning i to a. The whole thing could be way collapsed. Um, that the the issue there is that in more complicated code, that may not always be reachable. Okay. And you know this this technique works essentially on everything. Okay. Uh, and at the worst and the worst thing that it does is it, there's a few extra um, there's a few extra instructions. <coughs> But those few extra instructions are straight line code that are duplicating stuff that we'd be doing anyway, just okay. abstracting the first trip. Uh, the, and the other thing is that uh, there's a number of cases in things like if then else where we're also uh, able to do path splitting and do uh, type analysis. Okay, so now let's move on to the other big game that we had this year, which is non local variable access. What we've got now is Namespace up bar is implemented as long as the local variable name is constant. And if you're doing, oh, or, and if you're doing namespace up bar with a non-constant local variable name, you don't deserve to have your code optimized. <laughs> global are fully implemented again as long as the name is constant. Um, up bar one gets special handling. The uh, data flow analysis can detect that it up bar one uh, it, of add argument to a constant name, which is the common case, is, uh, is that common case, and changes that to putting in the procedure signature that that's a variable passed by reference. 
Um, up var one constant name to name. There's also special handling there that it becomes a new pass by reference that uh, will look it up in the uh, call frame of the caller at the call time and pass it by reference into the procedure. Um, up bar to an arbitrary level is implemented, but it's extremely slow. Because that actually does have, you then have the cost that everything in the call tree above it has to have everything in sync in the call frame at all times. Um, up bar to the global scope just works. Dollar colon colon path to variable works. Uh, without the leading colon colon, it doesn't work. Uh, we don't have uh, access to non-constant local names. Uh, we don't have access to arbitrary stack levels from global. Uh, that's probably implementable without too much trouble. Up for zero, uh, we are trying very hard to assume that local variables are not aliased. I'll get, to, I'll get to that. So up var zero is going to be a little challenging. And namespace variable without the colon colon in the front. Uh, I'll get to that too. And all of these ones that aren't done are uh, not done because they cause two local variables to point unexpectedly to the same name or that we don't know where a variable name is pointing. And that wrecks the assumptions because you can assign to an unrelated variable and all of a sudden your careful assumption that I know this is an int because I put an int in there goes out the window. You might have to change your code to take the very best advantage of this because um, the variables that are non-local are still kept in tickle logic. So like this accumulation that's doing typical descriptive statistics, it's doing count sum, sum of squares. If that loop's going to be executed a whole lot of times, you do, you do much better to copy those global variables to local values first, go through the loop incrementing the local values, and then copy them back out so that you're not repeatedly hitting the global values because hitting a global value, you have to box it in a tickle wash. <coughs> hitting, a, hitting a local value, it remains a local machine code value. There's still a lot to do. There's a long compilation time. <coughs> LLVM is pretty slow, and quad code is even slower. But a lot of that is that it's written in tickle. So uh, there may be an opportunity just to compile it. We, <laughs> we haven't tried that yet. <laughs> Um, there's a large volume of generated code. It generates, uh, it's typical machine generated code. It generates just a lot of instructions. Uh, that, uh, and there's, uh, particularly with the high specialization of procedures, you get a lot of uh, proliferation of the copies. I mean, it's not that bad. You typically may be getting you know, four copies of each procedure, but it's you know, still code volume. And that stresses the downstream compiler. Compiler writers in general hate dealing with machine generated code because machines don't write code in the style that humans do, and you get very different challenges <laughs> trying to optimize it. And in particular, early versions of LLVM3 simply crashed when we <laughs> gave us our code. Uh, LLVM4 is a lot better in that respect. Um, there's uh, incomplete language support. There's a lot of things that we know how to do. There's always things that are going to be too dynamic to compile, but the interpreter is always available. One thing to watch out for is that if you are doing really dynamic things with a val and such like, you, uh, that won't be called from machine code. Because again, it does unpredictable things to uh, outer context on the stack. It can go out and up level. And so, so, again, all the assumptions that we'd have of uh, 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 that this is an integer because we put an integer there go out the window. Uh, but, uh, but most people don't code that way. In most cases, your performance-critical code is even in tickle. It's nice and static. 
and it's being called by some sort of dynamic uh, 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 dispatch, but the actual inner loops are nice and static things that we can compile. The next steps are we want to do up level. That's uh, going to be limited. I was saying initially to constant scripts and constant arcs of the caller, and I looked through the uses of up level and tickle live and realized that's not good enough. So this will also, uh, I think this will also include up leveling to list of, to something constructed with list or with one of the list operators where the command name is constant. Uh, so that that's something that I can uh, then cause the procedure to generate a closure that will be compiled in the caller scope. As long as the substituents are constant in the caller's scope, which they usually are, uh, then, you know, for instance, control colon colon do constructs a while loop that is then evaluated in the caller's scope. But the condition of that while loop is constant in the caller's scope. The body of the loop is constant in the caller's scope. It produces something that in inlining the procedure I can compile. And that actually will cover most of the non-head scratching cases in tickle life. And there seem to be a lot of head scratching cases in Tickle Live where people thought that Tickle was constructing closures that are doing up level pound zero in order to escape a closure that isn't there. Uh, or bizarre things like up, up level pound zero namespace of Val where they don't need <laughs> stack context. Uh, <laughs> so some of that is. <laughs> Some of that is just uh, too, uh, too weird, but really uh, we're to the point where we need to get some user experience. Uh, uh, question. When you hit those head scratching cases where people appear to have been making assumptions that are not in accordance with reality, is there a way to run the compiler so you give a warning and don't compile? Um, um, yes. Yeah. I mean, we can, we're, we don't. We're not very good at giving warnings yet. We are very good at refusing to compile things. Well, and if we refuse to compile things, you simply have to check the product still sitting in your scope. Does it tell you why? Um, so that you can fix it. It tells you. It tells you a sort of why. <laughs> why might not be one of the Yes, it is certainly on our list of things to do to okay. improve the explanations. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, <coughs> would it be possible, or is it a good thing to do the analysis of, we know this is not going to compile, so you can have a link that says, hey, these things aren't going to compile, fix it, don't even bother trying to run it through the compiler. Um, unfortunately, we discover most of those things fairly late like, in trying to compile. That's all it's for. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we go pretty far down the pipe before we discover that we're in a situation that we don't have a case to handle. Right. Um, on the other hand, I would really like to have our compiler's front end uh, integrated in things like Noggle Okay. So that the existing pickle linter can uh, uh, add uh, information about that's data flow dependent. That would not only include things that we can't compile, but things that we know in compilation are strange. There is a number of cases where you know, we have things like a type check within a loop. Right. That uh, we know that's actually a pretty that uh, if we there are cases where we know we have the result of pretty strange code. Or well, where you can warn them, like in the example you showed, by using locals instead of globals. Right. And one of the one of the low hanging fruit is um, uh, static warning of local variable may be used before initialization. That's one that we don't generate right now, but easily could, because that is simply any ex any existence check that remains on a local after optimization is a case where that local might have been used before initialization. So then the other recur... Yes, sorry? 
So you yeah. consider just making a sub language that would be safe for this compiler that you can just have your own parser to, to check it at that level? Um, so, you know, having to get 10x out of essentially a variant of Tickle with fairly draconian rules, I, I don't need to compile Tickle Lib. I need to compile my code. Right, and I would think you, to some extent you already have that. And the only thing is that you know, if you don't comply with the rules, you get interpreted up. And yes, we can add warnings about what you're doing that is causing you to get interpreted up. So in, in Scala Native, they admit their intermediate representation that they use over LLVMs so you can see kind of what they're getting. It's a lot more visible than the Quadro was for the Quadro's kind of box. Um, Scala Native. They took a different tack where they, they actually exposed their, their intermediate above LLVM so you can see like what it figured out from their optimizer. I think I'll have to defer that to Donald. <laughs> so that's that's also an SSA. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to LLVM, then you want to go to SSA. <laughs> Internal read is totally SSA, but it's totally driven by SSA. There's the principle, there's the reason why we could, why couldn't have at least uh, um, people having these functions which are used in the system which um, will obey as long as they have an AR type then they will be possible to introduce them to any system for, for people to be able to call, call them so that they can introduce their own um, code that way it's, we haven't yet put anything in, in to do that simply it's not being a <coughs> target, but it, 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 it would be relatively straightforward to do so. Uh, I mean, another thing you consider is just instead of using LLVM directly switching to their their NIR language, because then you would benefit from their uh, optimizer that we're building on that for the things uh, the LLVM doesn't be We have, I, I have been experimenting with with calling the with calling the LLVM optimizer, but essentially that's just <coughs> we to do that we save our code out, then we then, then we call the program which uses the same library to actually do the optimization. So uh, there's no gigantic command of that, and then and as we call that, and at the same time you have the problem that you end up with having to call the optimizer the right version. Right, and which gets rather complicated in other places. Yeah, that's, there's some confusion here. What I'm trying to tell you is that like they have run into all these same issues. They're on the same path for Scala, for native Scala, and their choice was to make this new intermediate representation language so that they have a package that can spare a product to do the optimizations that all of you can do. I mean, at, at the moment, I would say that what, what we are doing is we are um, the we have an intermediate representation of our code, which enables us to do a lot of type reasoning, and from there, there you we have a, an example of a way of taking that. Code and then mapping it into a code, a standard code generation. It could go to others. It may also be possible for someone to take uh, a the quad code and just interpret that directly. And that would again that would be possible. And I don't know what the performance impacts of doing that. Uh, it's um, you certainly should have sufficient information to be able to do that. Um, we, it's just that our, our implementation strategy for now is to, to, is to take our code, convert to LLVM, to in, internal representation, and then 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 out the machine. That's what that's what yeah. 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 we're in. I think this was one that's good to take offline. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's tremendously exciting to get all the burning questions, but Cliff has been gesturing to me madly about 10 minutes over time already. Yeah, <laughs> and I did have one question. You mentioned wanting more users. What is the um, user level of this. You said that it was going to, it was not a JN, JIT. Will your output run in a regular interpreter or do I need the new interpreter? No, the <coughs> output will run in a regular interpreter and 
Dongle is on the cusp of releasing a compiler that will take a bucket of tickle prox and produce a loadable module. Cool. That I can use with any of my clients then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's yeah. okay. That will be the book. Okay. Cool. And they obviously will be in the room afterwards tonight so that people can talk. Yeah, Thank y'all very much. Thank you. <laughs>